Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome back to Sonoikis Digital Classics Summer Term 2023. Uh, today is our third session of this uh, uh, semester and I'm very happy that our guest today is Anne Chen. Um, this is the first time for Anne in Sonoikis, so Anne, thank you very much for joining our program and for presenting your work. Anne is an assistant professor at the Bard College, assistant professor of art, history, and visual culture. That's correct. And she's working on uh, this project, Hondura Europos. And today, um, she's presenting on a great project, which is about the use of, uh, um, let's say, she's presenting on this project on Dura Europos, but um, today she will show us she will show us how to use uh, uh, Wikidata, how they are using Wikidata in this uh, project. And in fact, uh, the title of this session is Wikidata for Classicists, the example of the International Digital Dura Europos Archive. As usual, you have uh, um, a complete description of this uh, session in GitHub. You have the link uh, in YouTube and you have a detailed uh, description with the uh, the list of the topics that Anne is going to present today. You also have many links, not only for the project, but also for specific examples that Anna is going to show us. And then you have many resources, references, open access, bibliographic references for this project, for this work, and then other resources. But, uh, um, and another thing, um, Gabriel Bodar was supposed to join us today. Unfortunately, uh, he's busy. There are other duties <laughs> conflicting with our session. So unfortunately, he's not able to be with us. But uh, anyway, so we're here. And Anne, thank you very much again for joining the program. Anne is also um, an active member of the Pelagius Network. And, uh, um, and I'm happy to say that uh, she began to uh, work with Gazetteers all, also thanks to Sonoikis Digital Classics, to our program. So I wanted to mention this uh, because she was very nice to, to say that. So finally, we, we have you here today. I think, um, and we can see uh, a message from uh, Gabriel Bodar saying hi. So remember that uh, um, you, for, this is for the audience, uh, you can ask questions in the chat. So please write your questions if you have any questions and uh, we will answer these questions during this presentation or uh, at the end during our uh, discussion. But Anne, so uh, thank you, welcome. I think we can start. So please, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I am... Yes, we are struggling with... <laughs> a technical difficulty, which the irony of being uh, a presenter on uh, digital humanities topic and uh, struggling with, <laughs> with the technology is uh, not lost on me, but um, I am just getting my PowerPoint to uh, be able to share. Uh, can you share your entire screen? Yeah, I can try that as well. I think it's it's a setting on my side, perhaps. It's saying that the uh, do you have a do you get a message or something? Just yeah, it's saying that there's. Um, uh, permissions issue with, with ah. Chrome. Ah, okay, maybe you have to 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 give the permission, and I think you have to restart Chrome probably. <laughs> if this okay. is so far, we can wait for you. So okay, I mean, I'm sorry about that. No problem, no problem. We're used to technical issues, so we'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, so in the meantime, we wait for Anne. So this happens also because uh, probably this was the first time she was using StreamYard. But anyway, so she will uh, come back uh, uh, very soon, uh, as I was saying before. So this is a session 
um, about the use of Wikidata in a specific project, this project, the International Digital Dura Europos Archive. So we will see, we will see very interesting uh, examples of the use of uh, Wikidata um, uh, for specific, for, for the, in this project. And uh, if you um, read the class outline in, in GitHub for this session, you will see a specific uh, examples um, of different, different objects from this archaeological site and how it's possible to, um, to include these objects in Wikidata, adding metadata, and we will so also see very interesting examples for the annotation of images in, uh, in Wikidata. Um, and uh, there are many interesting uh, um, topics uh, um, for the session of today because uh, we will talk not only about the use of this technology and of this resource, which is Wikidata, but we will see, we will uh, try at least to, to address important questions about uh, uh, the preservation of our cultural heritage. We will also address the question about ethics of access, like metadata and multilingualism, and we will see what we mean by that, collaborative curation, of course, and then other very interesting uh, issues and challenges uh, for um, archaeological sites, excavations, and uh, how to um, record information about them uh, using digital technologies. And uh, um, in the outline, you can see we, we have many uh, different resources, not only a link to this specific project about Dura Europos, but also um, the project in Wikidata. And then we will also um, mention uh, gazetteers, of course, uh, and other resources uh, um, for this project, uh, and um, also for um, the topic concerning linked open data, because, of course, uh, um, uh, this kind of work um, is connected to linked open data. But now Anna is back again, okay? okay and this time. <laughs> so try to share your screen. So I think now it should work. Oh, man, no. Oops, why not? I, it's still saying that Google Chrome is locked. Um, maybe I'll try in a different browser. Let's see if I can. Um, Sorry, Monica. <laughs> No problem, no problem. Uh, really. This is not the first time that we have <laughs> technical issues. So take your time. I was uh, uh, going through your class outline in web and um, you, you have a PowerPoint, you said. Yes. Um, uh, okay. to, it, it won't let me... Um... It won't let me... Uh... Uh, even share my my Chrome screen, so I can't even move it over to a a, a Google uh, slide deck. Uh, because yeah, uh, usually uh, let me see if. Uh... Uh, yes, so if you try to, if you click on present, uh, you can mm -hmm. share screen or your slides, but uh, usually you have to select share screen. And it doesn't work, you said. No, it doesn't. Um, and I, so it doesn't open a, a window telling you choose what to share with the StreamYard. Ah, that's, that's. Uh, I don't know how to help. Uh, do you want to send me your slides, maybe? <laughs> no? Yeah, I, I suppose that that's maybe the, the next route. Uh, you, you don't have slides in Google. It's, it's a PowerPoint, yeah. Yeah, it's the, it's the security. Um, for some reason, it's not allowing me to unlock.
Okay, I'll just I'll send you the slides and we'll just have to um, proceed that way. Okay, we are just. Uh, um, okay, I'm waiting for the slides and see. I think we need, uh, uh, it's not immediate. <laughs> yeah, it's taking a while for the, the images to upload. It's almost done now. Okay, it should have gone through now. Okay, so. Okay, here they are. <laughs> well, this is. Uh, <laughs> That's promising. <laughs> Have technology, but of course, so um, um, ah, okay, is uh, um, uh, okay, is wait a second. Um, so I download the file, okay, because I don't think I can use. Uh, Google, okay, okay, uh, a second, and then uh, let's see, okay, um, whoops, um, now the only thing is that, uh, um, Okay, let's see if uh, uh, it <laughs> okay. Uh, um, no, okay. Share screen. Um, um, entire screen. One second, because the only thing is that, okay, uh, now I'm sharing and uh, um, because I'm, I also have to, uh, so I have to add this to the stream. And now, can you see the oh, slides? There we are. Yes, I can see it now. Awesome. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can go on. And so you. Um, okay. Good. I hope in YouTube is working because I'm alone today, so I can't see YouTube. And I hope uh, this is the only thing. So, <laughs> and uh, yes, I I I think um, this is working. Um, and I'm checking YouTube. Yes, and uh, ah, yes, the only thing is that I have to do this so we can see only the slides. Okay, okay, please, Anne, we can, go, we can okay. start. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for your patience and thanks to uh, Monica and for Gabby uh, for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you a little bit about uh, the uses that our project, the International Digital Dura Europos Archive, 
is uh, finding for Wikidata and uh, to talk with you a little bit about uh, some of the, the pros and cons, the challenges that we're running into, uh, the things that we were concerned about that uh, we've, we've found ways around, uh, things like that. Um, Monica, if you would advance the slide, please. Yeah. So I'm going to start out today uh, to by touching a little bit on uh, a review of linked open data and specifically uh, giving you a sense of uh, the Wikidata terms that that relate to um, uh, linked open data. So um, I understand that previously in this in this course you've covered linked open data, but for those who might be uh, just dipping in for for one session. Um, terminology that you may have heard before uh, connected with the concept of linked open data is uh, semantic web. Semantic web is basically the concept of uh, a allowing for human and machine readable links between data sets. So uh, linked open data is a, is a series of design principles and best practices for actually bringing about the, uh, the vision of the semantic web, for actually sharing data sets on the web um, and ultimately, uh, what, what this uh, uh, methodology is aimed at is creating what we can call a, a web of knowledge. So basically mapping the relationships between uh, people and things and events and um, uh, places, um, artifacts, uh, all kinds of, of different concepts that have lots of different uh, uh, interrelated relationships to one another. Uh, publications are another of those. So basically, um, Wikidata is a kind of linked open data, and we'll get into that. So the way that linked open data uh, shares information or creates links between uh, independent data sets is uh, with a structure called RDF. Um, and specifically, it's, it's a, a way of kind of breaking apart nuggets of information in a way that uh, both computers and humans can understand it. And uh, sometimes you'll, refer, you'll hear this referred to as structured data. And the way of creating these statements is basically to have a, a subject, a predicate, and an object, and to draw relationships between the, the subject, predicate, and object. So for instance, at Dura, we could think of you know, the subject being a very specific artifact, maybe a, an inscription, uh, and the predicate being the, um, the action word. Uh, so this object was excavated at, uh, and then the object being Dora Europos. So that's, that's a way of, um, of kind of un, untethering uh, metadata statements. Um, busting them into these little compartments that uh, both a, a human and a, a computer can understand. Um, let's advance the slide. There is uh, an analogous concept uh, to RDF in Wikidata. And so basically what you, the Wikidata way of uh, creating those semantic triples or those RDF triples um, uses what are called uh, items and properties in Wikidata terminology. So items have Q numbers and properties have P numbers. Um, and in preparation for this class, it was recommended that you follow the, or you work your way through the uh, Wikidata professional uh, development training tutorials. And if you haven't done that, I would, I would highly uh, suggest it if you're interested in um, working in Wikidata. So for instance, uh, in, in Wikidata, to create a statement about a particular inscription and where it was found, we would uh, do something very similar to what I just described with RDF. We have a very specific artifact. So the, the object that is known as the large altar to the gods of Palmyra, uh, that's our subject uh, or our um, item, our starting item. Its location of discovery is a property, and uh, that is um, the middle section of our statement here. And it was discovered at the site of Dora Europos, and that's our third section, our object. In Wikidata, then, this all gets translated into uh, alphanumeric codes that are language agnostic, uh, meaning that, uh, well, that, 
the the meaning will will uh, be apparent uh, soon enough. So maybe I'll hold on to that thought for for just a moment. But essentially, the large altar to the Palmyrian gods is uh, the same as the first Q number that you see on your screen. Then uh, the the predicate, the location of discovery, is the the property number P one eight nine that you see in the middle section, and uh, then the following Q number is uh, um, the concept of the archaeological site of Dora Europos. All right, let's advance the slide. So what's the difference between uh, Wikidata and Wikibase? These are uh, two terms that you may have heard of uh, if you've been kind of sniffing around the, uh, the wiki uh, verse a little bit and have been interested in linked open data. Um, and I'd also like to go over why it matters. So uh, Wikidata is uh, Wikibase. So Wikidata is basically the, the public collective uh, open editorial version of uh, the, the Wikibase technology. So Wikidata is the largest instance of uh, Wikibase. And this has a couple of um, repercussions that, that I wanna make you aware of. So um, on one hand, that means that uh, Wikidata is a, a project that is hosted, the, the data for the project is actually hosted by the Wikimedia Foundation. So when you're contributing to Wikidata, um, you don't necessarily have to worry about hosting your own data. It's, it's hosted by the Wikimedia Foundation. The, the difference with Wikibase, you can set up your own instance of Wikibase, basically using the technologies that, that Wikidata uses. Um, but in that case, you're responsible for for self-hosting. Um, so Wikidata is the, the uh, is a version <laughs> that is um, useful specifically for individuals who may not have a lot of uh, technical experience for setting up their own triple stores, um, which are the, the kind of uh, uh, data storage option that, that you need for hosting uh, structured data uh, on a wiki base. Um, it's I'm, also important because, yes. Sorry, uh, um, I'm yes. showing the correct slide. Yes, okay. that is correct. Good, good, okay. Yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Um, so with, with Wikidata, uh, this can be a more accessible option, say for institutions that uh, maybe don't have a lot of resources or uh, individuals who don't have a lot of resources or technical help. Um, the the other implication, though, is the the openness of the editorial community. So in Wikidata, it's an open editorial system, meaning that anybody can contribute to uh, the representations of uh, objects or information that is contributed to Wikidata. Um, I'll talk more about the implications of that and why we think that's a good thing uh, in the context of our particular project. But there is also this opportunity uh, with Wikibase if you're concerned about you know, keeping editorial control over your data, um, to bring it under a, a closed editorial system. Uh, and that would be setting up your own instance of Wikibase, not contributing to the, uh, the, the public and collective uh, Wikidata option. All right, um, so I think that gives you enough background of uh, what we're diving into here with, with Wikidata. Monica, if you'd go ahead and um, advance. I'll turn now to introducing the project uh, that I direct. This is the International Digital Dura Europos Archive. We call it IDEA for short. And I hope to show you um, with this case study uh, some of the exciting possibilities that Wikidata holds for those of us that are classical world inclined, um, but of whatever flavor you like. So that could be classicist, that could be historian, art historian, archaeologist, or any other classics adjacent field. Um, but as they say, with great power comes great responsibility. So I'll also aim to highlight some of the areas that this um, new frontier uh, uh, offers that, that deserve some caution and additional thought. So the idea endeavor is 
using Wikidata as its project backend. So in layman's terms, I mean that we're building a user-friendly web page where users will land and be able to search and interact with the content. I'll show you a, a preview of that just briefly at the end. Um, they'll be able to interact with content related to the archaeological site of Duria Ropos. But when a user searches in Ideas Interface, all of the results that they'll see will be supplied from a uh, from content that our team and uh, other worldwide contributors are um, uh, generating in, in Wikidata. So bear with me for a few minutes while I give you some important context about the specific site and the history of its exploration so that you have a basis for understanding the rationale for uh, our choice of Wikidata. Can we advance the slide? Thank you. So IDEA is interested specifically in reassembling and recontextualizing archeological information from the ancient site of Dury Europos and is fortunate to have recently received funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities to carry out this work. Um, we are using linked open data and the Wikidata platform specifically to digitally reassemble materials that are in separate collections across the world uh, and to provide more transparent and easily intelligible context for buildings and artifacts discovered at a time when there was interest uh, more in kind of unearthing museum quality uh, pieces than in highlighting the contextual relationships and assemblages um, that came from the site. And finally, we're also using this methodology, and this is one of the things I'd like to highlight today, to improve inequalities in access uh, to the information and materials from the site, um, specifically those that are held in the West. Can we advance, please? All right. So the archaeological site known by modern scholars as Dury Europos is located on the western bank of the Euphrates in what is today Syria. Um, it was founded by the Seleucids around 300 BCE, then conquered by the Arsacids around 113 BCE. And then there was a, a brief interlude of, of Roman occupation sometime in the second century, uh, after which the Arsacids were able to regain control. Um, and then they maintained control of the site until the 160s, when the Romans took control of the site and ultimately established a military presence. Um, Roman Dura Europos ultimately fell to a Sasanian siege, and part of the uh, this, this was part of the Romano-Persian conflicts that uh, kind of reached a boiling point in the reign of the Sasanian king Shapur I around the middle of the third century. Can we advance, please? Excavations at the site began a century ago when Syria was governed by the French Mandate. Um, French and American institutions funded and managed the work in its early phases, while an Arab workforce carried out the backbreaking physical labor for low wages that were often uh, dangerous conditions. Um, more recently, starting in 1987, a Franco-Syrian joint team continued investigation of the site, especially its earliest phase, and remained working at the site until the outbreak of the Syrian civil war that is now uh, over a decade um, uh, ago that that started. Next slide. Since 2011, the site has been ravaged by systematic looting, um, as evident from the satellite imagery that I'm showing you here. The pock marks that you see in the 2014 photo are looters pits systematically dug across the site in hopes of recovering artifacts that could be sold illegally on the global art market. Tragic as the, the looting at the site is, there's more to the story than is typically acknowledged. Recent ethnographic style research by my colleagues Jennifer Baird and Adnan al Mohammed has documented the perspectives of Syrians who live in the vicinity of uh, Dury Europos. And they've noted the local inhabitants' reflections that Western generated information pertinent to the site has never been widely available in Arabic. It hasn't been possible, for instance, to search for any of the, the content in the West. Uh, associated with the site in Arabic. Given the ways in which the local population was systematically alienated from the creation of knowledge in the early era of excavation at the site, 
and the ways in which Western generated ideas have never been shared back with the locals, it shouldn't come as a surprise that when faced with real hardship, some have treated the site as any other natural resource in order to um, exploit it and make ends meet. Next slide. Since its initial systematic investigation, Dura has become justly famous thanks to the unique circumstances of preservation that resulted in the site's retention of significant organic materials uh, and other traces of daily life that have long vanished elsewhere. Next slide. Uh, this includes the earliest archeologically known and documented Christian church. Next slide as well as the most elaborately decorated synagogue from antiquity that has so far been discovered. Next slide. And both of these are set cheek by jowl with uh, worship spaces of coexistent pagan religious communities. This is a site that has turned up evidence for numerous ancient languages, including Greek, Latin, Aramaic, Hebrew, Sephitic, and Middle Iranian, and uh, that saw successive control by three different ancient civilizations. Um, the cultural complexity at the site, the ways that that cultural complexity maps onto the skill sets of different academic disciplines, such that no one scholar, for instance, was able to translate all of the inscriptional content from the site. And so the work was divvied up among uh, different linguistic specialists and published separately. Or the, the tendency of previous eras to emphasize categorization over context. So that, for instance, the inscriptions are treated separately uh, from the wall paintings um, or uh, relief of which they're a part. Um, all of this complicates the ability to work with information from old excavations like this one. So one of the, the reasons I'm stressing, uh, go back a slide for me. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> one of the reasons I'm stressing Dura's ancient and modern history then is in order to point out that it's a case study for the use of Wikidata, with a lot of points of transferability for whatever projects uh, that those of you in the audience might have in mind. On the one hand, there is a site where you're dealing with legacy data. Um, so since the excavations began at the site 100 years ago, there's a lot of primary data. So buildings, inscriptions, texts, artworks, excavation archives, plus uh, the interpretational knowledge that has accreted over time. Um, so in the last hundred years, there's tons of bibliography and shifting interpretations to wade through when trying to make uh, use of information for this site. Then there's also points of transferability in the methodology that have to do with physical locations. So a site like Dura has physical things uncovered at the site, like architectural bits, that were left in situ, while the things found associated with the physical architecture, so that's things like paintings or inscriptions, papyri, other artifacts, uh, were shipped off, shipped off site and today reside in different collections across the world. Um, then there's the archival aspect. At Dura, we have archival documents and 100 years of bibliography that attest both to the processes of excavation and the conservation st status of buildings and objects at the time of discovery 100 years ago. Um, these archival documents often allow us to fill in significant details of biographies for people associated with the site and its discovery, and analogously, to fill in what you might call biographical details of artifacts and buildings as well. There are likely other uh, overlaps that I'm missing, but the other big one that I want to highlight uh, is the context of colonialism and its persistent impacts. This is an area uh, that is really in need of careful thought. Um, so how do we proceed ethically in uh, making content that may have impact on living individuals uh, available via linked open data? We'll come back to this. Next slide. So in a nutshell, what our project is working to do in Wikidata is to create records for all of the artifacts, the buildings, the people, the archival documents and publications uh, associated with the site and to trace the relationships between them uh, and to establish this uh, with the, the uh, Wikidata uh, uh, semantic um, structure. So basically translating these relationships into Q numbers and P numbers 
such that uh, both the computer and the person could uh, kind of find their way through uh, uh, the, the, relate, the web of relationships between uh, different kinds of data. Using an archeological site as a case study for a class like this is um, useful because archeological sites are intersections of heterogeneous data types that are traditionally uh, associated with different disciplines of study for the ancient world. So I'm thinking here of um, spatial or landscape data uh, that can be in uh, antiquity or in the modern world. Uh, this is architecture, art and material culture, inscriptions, graffiti, numismatics, archival documentation, historical texts that may mention the, the ancient place or modern bibliography and all the evolving interpretations of, of uh, uh, the site and the things associated with it. Um, each of these different kinds of data sets tends to be treated by a different uh, specialty area and has its own um, databases and conventions around how uh, the, that particular type of information is represented. What is wonderful about something like Wikidata is that it is very flexible and allows for someone to uh, uh, grapple with data types that, that fit into any of these niche areas and allow them to speak to each other and uh, be searchable together in a multilinguistic environment. So in some ways, uh, since any text or object or building or author has to be understood in its own context, we can think of archaeology as kind of a bridge between many different uh, modern disciplines so that hopefully this case study will prove relevant for folks who are contributing from lots of different perspectives uh, and working with lots of different uh, kinds of materials. Um, we understand today that there are there are these kind of fuzzy borders between uh, the data sets that typically belong to or are the, the focus of uh, different kinds of uh, specialties within our uh, area of study. Um, and so that means that what is necessary today with uh, digital data is that we are um, conceiving of it in a way that it can be utilized and built upon uh, by, by uh, researchers or scholars or students uh, even uh, who are in different kinds of uh, disciplinary areas. So this is another reason why um, working in the, in the Wikidata environment in particular, uh, where it's this kind of clearinghouse that, that allows for uh, connections between um, uh, areas uh, that are typically the purview of, of different disciplines uh, to um, allow the data to, to speak across those disciplinary divides. All right, uh, next slide. So how do we establish these uh, relationships? Um, again, this goes back to uh, asserting a series of statements. Um, so uh, basically, breaking information, the metadata associated with any uh, person, place, thing, event, uh, et cetera, um, into a, a tripartite relationship. So uh, the item, uh, a relationship, uh, the item is a, is a Q number in uh, Wikidata terms. The relationship um, that you're articulating uses a P number, and then uh, that connects to either an additional uh, Q number or holds a, a value. And so essentially we're creating a, a map using uh, nodes and edges, uh, asserting these relationships between uh, different items. And uh, Wikidata is just one part of the, the linked open data ecosystem, if you will. So you may have seen uh, visualizations like the one that I'm showing you on the right. Uh, this is like a, a cloud of, or web of knowledge, if you will, um, that shows a, a kind of schematic map of the relationships between all kinds of different uh, content on the web. And uh, so the, the Wikidata relationships that our team is establishing um, would make up a, a part of this uh, web of knowledge. And uh, because Wikidata essentially allows you to work with 
different kinds of content. So people, places, things, uh, events, uh, etc. cetera. Um, it does mean that it's kind of like a microcosm uh, within the, the web of knowledge. So uh, linked open data more broadly uh, would allow for different data sets curated by, by different groups uh, who make their data open on the internet to uh, borrow from, from each other's knowledge and uh, build upon each other's knowledge uh, by tracing these uh, relationships. Um, but within Wikidata uh, and, and within the linked open data ecosystem, then you could have projects that are maybe linked data projects uh, talking about people or inscriptions or uh, buildings or places and uh, map connections among those different things. You have a similar uh, kind of uh, 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 mechanism happening within the, the Wikidata ecosystem. So Wikidata is just like a corner of the linked open data um, ecosystem. I also want to stress that uh, Wikidata in particular is meant to have uh, every one of the statements that is attributed, so each of these relationships that we're asserting uh, in Wikidata, should all be backed by authority data or uh, some other kind of citation. So this can be um, uh, the traditional uh, paper uh, scholarship. Um, and within Wikidata, there should be an entity uh, or an item for each bibliographic record. Um, and each author uh, for uh, the, the particular publication. And um, so if, for instance, we say that, you know, that this particular object at Dura Europos was, uh, its location of discovery was a specific tower, we can uh, then point back to the bibliographic citation where we uh, derived that information. Um, one of the things that is important to know um, that I want to flag here is that Wikidata doesn't uh, make you beholden to any one, uh, only a single value for, for each property. So the reason this is important is because, you know, with more uh, interpretational data, so something like, you know, this painting depicts Jesus or this painting depicts a shepherd. Uh, those are statements that have both been made in the literature and uh, different authors might argue differently. And so we could create uh, a, a statement for a particular painting depicts Jesus and then point back to a bibliographic citation specifically for the author that argues that. And uh, then a contrasting value, um, you know, author B, or the painting depicts, uh, you know, the uh, a shepherd, um, and uh, pointing back to the bibliographic rec record that uh, offers that in particular. Um, one of the things that I, I want to highlight about the the Wikidata as a microcosm within the web of knowledge is that uh, it's because of that, it, it is a good place for folks who are interested in linked open data uh, to kind of get their feet wet. It's, it's a way of, um, it's a more accessible uh, form of linked open data for people and institutions without access to financial and personnel resources uh, for hosting their data, but uh, also for uh, maybe, you know, the professional development it would take to learn to code and One of the things that I, I want to highlight is that this is a, an equity and decolonial issue, right? So uh, with the, the rise of linked open data, um, there is a danger of those of us in the West only talking to other people in the West and uh, that collections in the West get uh, moved into a linked open data uh, ecosystem um, while other collections that have long been marginalized maybe continue to be marginalized uh, because of the uh, lack of, of resources and personnel and uh, things like that. Um, I'm not saying that Wikidata can necessarily solve that problem, but it does remove some of the, the hosting barriers and uh, the multilingual interfaces, et cetera, um, uh, make it a little more possible for, for colleagues elsewhere to learn to use it and to um, find ways to point back to their collections uh, in ways that might help to uh, mitigate some of the, the gaps that we've had in um, 
certain collections being very uh, searchable and discoverable online and others uh, not getting much attention because they're more difficult to access. All right, next slide. Um, so on that topic then, uh, cultural heritage and the ethics of access. One of the things that I wanna point out is that we don't often think about the fact that metadata, so by that I mean the factual statements about um, any kind of, of uh, a collection object. So things like the title or the place that it depicts or um, you know, even the size, uh, those kinds of statements. Um, the cataloging language and the site name that are used to refer to um, or to describe the image in non-linked open data metadata, uh, we have to be aware that this is a, a subjectivity and that we are essentially creating only one pathway into discovering this object. So for instance, the name Dura Europos uh, of the site is not actually so straightforward, right? Different languages will spell it different ways. Uh, the French colleagues who work at the site often prefer Europos Dura as opposed to Dura Europos. And um, then we think about the fact that uh, our Arabic speaking colleagues or Japanese speaking colleagues, you know, will have different uh, ways of spelling the, the name uh, using their own um, uh, uh, writing systems, et cetera. Um, and this means that uh, there's a bias in who can easily uh, discover the content, right? Uh, people who, who speak English and can read the records and uh, know the, the English spellings of the names uh, or the, the French uh, spellings in, in the case of Dura Europos tend to uh, have a better chance of surfacing information related to Dura uh, than an Arabic speaker will right now well, not right now, but uh, prior to the work that we were doing in Wikidata, it was uh, not possible for someone to to search for the Western uh, content using Arabic terms uh, or place names uh, and script to uh, find information. So that's a subjectivity. And um, I'll get more into uh, the nuts and bolts of how linked open data can help. Um, next slide. So I think first to uh, kind of illustrate for you uh, how the multilingual aspect of Wikidata can be helpful in this regard, um, I want to show you, uh, walk you through an example. So just creating records for the artifacts, buildings, archival documents, bibliography, and people associated with Dora in the Wikidata environment now means that these items are discoverable in hundreds of languages at a basic level without any translation work. So I'm showing you here a Wikidata record for relief, a relief that's kept in the Yale University Art Gallery that depicts Heracles wearing the Nemean lion skin. Um, thanks to funding from the NEH, uh, IDEA's Arabic translation team headed by our Syrian colleague uh, Adnan al Muhammad is in the process of providing Arabic translations for all of the labels and descriptions and inscription translations on the site uh, or from the site. But before they even began that work, thanks to the global Wikidata editorial community, widely shared concepts that are relevant for the records from Dury Europos, uh, advance the slide. Yeah. So widely shared concepts like uh, archeological artifact have been translated into various world languages. So I've uh, highlighted for you here uh, the Arabic translation of the concept of archeological uh, artifact and a Japanese um, uh, translation as well. And advance the slide. The same record also, um, the, the concept for uh, Heracles has uh, similarly been translated into various world languages. So again, I've highlighted in Arabic and in uh, Japanese. Advance the slide. Yes. I'm also so what this means. Uh, so, what sorry for interrupting. I'm just adding the link, if I can, uh, in, uh, uh, in the chat, because the only thing is that the slide in this case is small. So I don't know if if uh, uh, this uh, link mm -hmm. is in, um, 
um, in the class outline. So sorry, Anne, for interrupting, but. Oh, I, I can uh, go in and and put in the the queries, uh, the links into these uh, okay. particular okay. queries after class, if anyway. that's desirable. Yeah, okay. sure. Um, so just in practice, then, this means that an Arabic or Japanese speaker uh, would be able to search in their own native language for the equivalent of archaeological artifact from Duria Ropos depicting Heracles and turn up the same results as someone who's searching in English. So this multilingual search capacity, uh, the ability to edit in multiple languages and to switch the user interface into multiple languages is one of the pros of working with Wikidata, especially if you're interested in uh, collaborative curation with communities that uh, speak languages other than English. And so I'll get into that now. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so by collaborative curation, I mean uh, that, you know, in the case of uh, the, the artifact that, you, or sorry, the, the record that you see on the top portion of your screen, um, you see that there's a, a man standing in front of a building, he's got an altar next to him, but all that the, uh, the non-linked open data metadata says about that object is that uh, it depicts a, a particular temple at uh, the site of Dura Europos. Um, and that's useful information for archaeologists, obviously, uh, but that's not the only thing that is going on in this image. And um, my colleague Jennifer Baird has done important work in drawing attention to the, the ways in which the uh, local workers at the site in particular have kind of been erased from the story of uh, the excavations. So there are ways that we could uh, revisit um, archival photographs like this and um, uh, reinterpret them, make new pathways into uh, the metadata and allow them to be discoverable and useful for, for um, other kinds of means than uh, how they were originally envisioned uh, as useful to the, the archaeologists who were documenting the site. Uh, so one of the things that we're interested in doing is, is documenting different perspectives on the, the content of images. Um, so somebody with a different skill set than my own might be able to mark up that image uh, on the uh, uh, top portion of your screen, drawing attention to the, the different articles of clothing that uh, he's wearing. Um, and uh, if we can advance the slide. There are also ways that we can use tools within the, the Wikidata environment to improve the metadata uh, for an object like this. So uh, one of the things that our team is doing is we're taking a static database, a static database of image data, and we're transitioning it into the Wikidata environment. Uh, and then we are using the Wikidata tools to um, make new assertions about things that are visible in the images, uh, but that are not um, uh, at first captured by the, the metadata for the image. Um, so let me talk you through this specific example a little more. In an image like this one, you see that it was originally cataloged in the archive as a field photograph um, of the Temple of the Palmyrene Gods. There's no mention in the metadata of the, uh, the human figure um, since the man in this image was conceived of as a, a reference scale by the excavators. Um, but LOD image annotations tools allow us to um, assert information uh, contained within the image but not necessarily expressed by its uh, original metadata. So what we're in the process of doing is uh, taking the existing metadata for an object like this um, parsing it into Wikidata statements, and then using the Wikidata environment to improve the, the metadata. And at the same time, we're uh, making it possible for future collaborative uh, uh, interactions with local stakeholders. So um, if we can advance, when you use the image annotation tool in Wikidata, you can uh, draw boxes around particular uh, parts of the image and then point out to a link um, for um, different kinds of content. So in this case, we have drawn a box around uh, tower number one. That's a very specific location with a, um, 
uh, a coordinate point that we can point to, and I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, at at Dury Ropos, we also know that uh, there is a man in the, the picture, and we know that there's a very specific altar. We're uh, looking to connect this altar with its specific um, uh, representation in Wikidata, but at some point we could point to the Q number for this specific artifact and say that it's depicted, that uh, this image depicts a, um, an altar. So as we're making these assertions and actually drawing on the image and uh, uh, articulating what is depicted within the image, that process then is actually writing new metadata statements to the uh, Wikidata record. So for instance, um, the statements here uh, say that um, this is a, a structured triple of uh, information. So basically saying that this object, uh, the, the archival photograph depicts as your, your predicate or your um, uh, property statement, uh, that it depicts a man. And so there's a Q number for the concept of just you know, a, a male figure. Um, and similarly, that uh, this, this particular photograph depicts uh, Tower One that is located, you know, uh, a very specific place within the, within the city. Um, so marking the images in this way then means with these Wikidata Q numbers, means that our team will be able to write a query for all the Dura images with humans in them and potentially partner with local stakeholders to take a look at them. And those local stakeholders might be able to add new information to these images, say, annotating based on the identity of the figure in the photo, or uh, as I mentioned before, perhaps what he's uh, wearing. And I'll come back to this at the end with uh, the, the notes of caution. Next slide. All right. Um, so Sorry. as I said before, yes. Is it correct? Yes, this is right. Um, okay. So as I said before, place names can be subjectivities, um, and this can can get rather complex. So um, I want to take a moment to to uh, explain some of the complexities at both the macro level and the micro level. Um, by macro, I'm talking about uh, naming traditions at the settlement level. So things like uh, the complexities around or the, the complexities for both a human user and a machine user or a reader uh, that that are inherent to um, a concept like Alexandria and Egypt is different than Alexandria and Pakistan. And at the micro level, you have uh, a similar kind of problem for uh, names of buildings, um, individual uh, uh, buildings within a site or, or features within a site. Those can have... Um, uh, coincident names or uh, inconsistent names. And those are the, the two um, aspects that, that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, I think that I was supposed to advance the slide a little bit. So uh, Monica, if you could just get one more. Uh, one more. <laughs> okay, uh, there we are. All right, so let's see. Um, each institution or database is with content relevant to a given place or a specific feature within an archeological site. So in our case, all the content related to the site of Dury Europos or all the content related to a particular building um, known variously over time and according to author um, as the temple of the Palmyrene gods, the temple of the Oriental gods, the temple of Bel, the temple of Zeus, all of these different names actually refer to the same place. Um, and each institution or database with content relevant to Dura may use a different version of a place name uh, in their own cataloging practices, um, in the text of a publication or in other sorts of metadata associated with, with uh, archival labels. In the absence of linked open data, accessing all the contextualizing content about Dura, um, whether that's in excavation notebooks or uh, traditional publications, um, or non-LOD databases and other digital formats requires command of an impossibly long list of what are essentially synonyms for the same place. Um, the reality of the complex naming tradition then makes it difficult 
difficult for speakers of any language to be sure that they've located all the content relevant to their area of inquiry. I'm showing you here just a, an example of um, how interfaces can be sensitive to the way that you spell a, a place name. Uh, so the uh, French spelling with the O gets gets results uh, at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, but the Anglo-American spelling without the O uh, doesn't turn up any results. Um, next slide. This same problem can also make it difficult for scholars to confidently identify where an object was found um, according to object metadata. Uh, next slide. Or to be sure which building is referenced by an archival photograph or drawing. So this is the problem of discoverability. How easy is it to surface the content that you're after in the digital realm? Um, as much of a challenge as that reality might be for uh, someone with the privilege of a Western uh, elite education, it's important to acknowledge the problematic ways in which uh, such expectations place an unrealistic burden on those who've been systematically disadvantaged. Uh, so including the local populations whose families have long resided in the vicinity of archaeological sites. Next slide. And uh, next, next group, next group, next group. <laughs> All right, that's good. Um, perfect. And uh, so just to, to get at this very quickly, you know, name changes can, can come based on, um, or Complexity around naming traditions can come based on place name inconsistency, which can come from uh, name change over time. And that can happen at the settlement level, the macro level, or at the, the micro level. So um, as I give you the example of the, tap the Temple of the Palmyrene Gods uh, was the original name that, that scholars preferred. Later, it became the Temple of Bell. That's contemporarily what is preferred, but the old scholarship still uses the uh, Temple of the Palmyrene Gods that can make it very difficult. Then you have multilinguality, right? Uh, different ways of spelling uh, the, the name that I've already alluded to, and this can be at the site level or the, the uh, level of an individual building or feature. And then you have difference of interpretation, right? So at the settlement level, the, the colleagues uh, from France that prefer Europos Dora uh, have good reasons for doing so, um, but it makes it difficult to, to uh, for someone who is not indoctrinated into that particular uh, choice to, to know that the content uh, labeled as Europos Dora is actually from the same site. And uh, similarly, depending on how a scholar interprets an individual building, uh, you could have a different place name associated with it um, uh, based on interpretation. So that's how we get this collection of lots of different names in English, all for the same building uh, in the northwest corner, um, referred to as the Temple of the Palmyrene Gods or Temple of Bell and uh, various other things. But then you also have uh, something interesting that has come up with the uh, research that, that I was telling you about uh, in connection with um, uh, the ethnographic work that my colleagues um, uh, Baird and Al-Muhammad are doing uh, with the local, the local population. In talking with the, the local folks, um, it has come out that essentially, you know, since they haven't had access to the, the uh, Western interpretations of these buildings and whatnot, there are wholly different uh, naming traditions and oral histories that are associated with these buildings among the local community. And um, so uh, at the macro level, for instance, the, the community tends to call the site um, by a name that translates to the wall. You can imagine how um, uh, that could be difficult to, <laughs> to uh, use for disambiguation purposes or discoverability purposes. Um, same thing with individual features. The Palmyrene Gate uh, translates to gate of the air uh, in the, the local oral tradition um, and has nothing to do with <laughs> Palmyra uh, in, that, in that version. So these are all valid uh, naming traditions. The complexity needs to be preserved, but uh, this wreaks havoc for interpretation and for um, uh, discoverability and uh, uh, for machines to understand uh, when things are you know, found at the same place or uh, whatnot. Next slide. 
Then there's an analogous concept. We have place name coincidence. Uh, so I uh, talked already about at the macro level, you could have places that have uh, the same name, but they are not the same place. And you need to find ways to uh, disambiguate between them. Um, so Alexandria and Egypt versus Alexandria and Pakistan. Uh, next slide. There's an analogous thing that happens at the micro level, right? We have a temple of Bell at Dura. There's also a temple of Bell at Palmyra. And it would be useful in a uh, digital realm to be able to differentiate between uh, uh, content that comes from one temple and uh, not the other. I've had many an undergraduate student uh, bring me images of the, the Temple of Bell at Palmyra because um, they weren't aware of the coincidence of place names. Okay, next slide. So why am I spending so much time on the complexities of place names? Well, because uh, that complexity, as I said, is important to uh, preserve for discoverability purposes. It provides uh, searchability, new pathways into uh, the content based on um, place names that, that occur to a particular user. Um, but as I said, that same complexity creates difficulties both for human users and uh, machines. This is a problem that linked open data can help with. Um, as you've learned in previous sessions, um, the very simplified idea of linked open data is that structuring digital records according to some shared principles uh, that allows for a lot of flexibility and implementation can ideally allow for data to speak the same computer-based language um, behind the scenes. And uh, this is no matter what human language is used in the cataloging. So structuring data according to LOD principles ideally allows for data sets to work together, allowing computers to understand uh, complex information and infer relationships between various topics, people, contexts, publications, data sets, and the like, more like humans. Within this ecosystem then, data from separately conceived but tangentially related projects can be used to mutually enrich both original data sets. So if you'll advance the slide. I've tried to schematize this for you here um, as it relates to uh, place names, um, since I think that concrete examples uh, kind of make the obscure concepts a little more uh, intelligible. So imagine that you have three separately cataloged and curated sets of different, different information, digital information, managed by three different entities. The two institutions on the left have records for items associated with the places marked in blue, and advance the slide. An LOD then would allow these two databases not only to talk to one another, but also to talk to the geographic database or a data set uh, on the right, and ultimately allowing the computer to infer that the objects in separate institutional databases are associated with the same place. Next slide. So examples of linked open data digital gazetteers that you may have heard of uh, include Pleiades, which is the gazetteer most relevant for the ancient Mediterranean, uh, the World Historical Gazetteer, and the Getty Thesaurus of Geographic Names. And all of these organizations are eager to work with contributors to improve and ex expand their uh, entries. Next slide. And so contrib contribution to and uh, deployment of digital gazetteers within the growing linked open data environment, uh, advance, can both streamline and improve the online discoverability of humanities content for English speakers, and uh, also make uh, ethically significant improvements in the digital accessibility of cultural heritage information of interest to users in uh, diverse global communities. Next slide. So in the realm of linked open data for archeology span and cultural heritage, digital, digital gazetteers play a critical role since the primary and secondary source material around which the disciplines revolve very often make mention of or uh, is otherwise attributable to places with fixed geographical locations. Um, so this includes, uh, if you'll just advance a series, uh, Monica, uh, this includes texts and material discovered in the course of excavations, that's archival documents and modern books and articles. But it's here that that naming tradition issue comes into play. So digital surrogates for each of these resources could be cataloged or labeled 
in various languages and refer in the object metadata to Dura Europos and or the specific building at Dura with which, all, with which all of these resources are associated with a variety of spellings or naming traditions. So this is where digital gazetteers can become extraordinarily helpful both for practical and ethical purposes. Next slide. So an example gazetteer record from Dura uh, illustrates how linked open data gazetteers essentially um, advanced, advanced slide, um, how they gather up all the known name variants for a place. Uh, that's what you're seeing in the, the uh, box, the larger box toward the top half of your screen. Um, they associate those that set of names uh, in various languages with a particular set of geographic coordinates. That's what you're seeing toward the bottom of your screen. And uh, then they assign that place a stable non-linguistic identifier. So it's language agnostic. You're not searching by name. The computer knows that it's just an alphanumeric code with which all of those different complex multilingual naming traditions are associated. So within the linked open data environment then, data managers of various databases or other resources can essentially tag the resources in their online collection with the stable identifier defined for the place um, that uh, gathers up, uh, uh, sorry, the, they can tag the record with the stable identifier for the particular place um, with which the resource is associated and thereby the metadata for the objects in their collection is enriched with all of the various naming traditions known to the gazetteer. This essentially means then that no matter the preferred way of referring to Jury Europos, uh, the Temple of Bell, um, that is chosen in a particular collection's metadata, so whether that's Temple of Bell or Temple of Palmyrian Gods or a name in Arabic script, or importantly, even the, the colloquial local name given to the same structure, as long as a digital record is tagged with the appropriate gazetteer ID, that record becomes linked to other digital entities associated with the same physical location, no matter how they call that physical location. So in our case, we're first creating authority place records by contributing to Pleiades. Then we're creating Wikidata items for all the relevant places at Dura in Wikidata. So that allows easy multilingual improvements over time. Uh, but this record also stays tethered to a high quality external resource. Um, meanwhile, reflecting the gazetteer place record into Wikidata allows us to use Wikidata's built-in tools for interacting with data and creating on-the-fly visualizations um, that I'll give some examples of in just a moment. Next slide. For now, it's important to understand that LOD gazetteers in general can create a kind of backbone for digital contextualization and digital reassembly of related materials. Um, next slide. There we are. Okay, so places defined within a linked open data gazetteer, uh, so like our Temple of Bell that we've been working with, can serve as a sort of virtual reassembly node for objects and archival materials that are potentially kept in different physical locations cataloged in different languages, and possibly following any number of different naming conventions. This is the approach that IDEA is taking with uh, regard to the work we're doing for Dura Europos, and uh, again, utilizing the Wikidata platform. More specifically, um, we're using institutional databases, so those are both linked open data databases and non-linked open data databases, as well as leg legacy sources like uh, archival plans, field notebooks and legacy publications to create spreadsheets of relationships that can be expressed in Wikidata's version of triples. Um, then we're using the open refine tool that communicates directly with Wikidata to contribute bulk uploads of statements about people, places, things, events related to Dura. Next slide. Another of the strengths of the Wikidata platform is the suite of built-in visualization and data manipulation tools that allow you to easy, easily generate uh, visualizations and or create uh, linked open data enrichments uh, with just a few clicks. I've already mentioned the image annotation uh, tool with the, the image positions tool. 
that allows you to enrich the metadata um, and write new statements to the object. The query service is another aspect um, that you can think of like a tool. It allows you essentially to interact with the power of structured data and generate things like on the fly maps, showing relationships between people, places, things, objects, without knowing how to use the Sparkle query language. Um, so what I'm showing you here on the bottom half of your screen, oh, I'm sorry, next slide. Um, what I'm showing you on the bottom half of your screen is a screenshot from the Wikidata query service where I have used their query helper, uh, which is on the left-hand side of the screen that allows you to uh, type in the, the content that you're looking for and helps you to uh, structure a Sparkle query that allows you to uh, make use of the, the visualizations that are built into Wikidata, like the map that I'm showing down below. Uh, I do also want to highlight that uh, there is a button toward the center of that uh, window um, that says Query Builder. And that is another interface that makes it even easier to uh, generate Sparkle queries that um, allow you to look at maps and uh, other kinds of visualizations of data. You could look at, say, webs of uh, relationships between different kinds of entities if you want to. And uh, it's just a matter of creating a query that, uh, or structuring a query that, um, that allows you to uh, uh, visualize the data set that, that you're interested in. Um, and I have included among your resources a, a really well done tutorial on how to query uh, using uh, Sparkle so that you can um, gain more facility and uh, uh, visualize more complex relationships. Um, but just in this particular uh, example that I'm showing you here, this is you know really basic and, and kind of simple. So building on that first gazetteer example that I've been working up for you, what you're seeing here is that we have created a statement on a particular uh, item saying that its location of discovery was a particular wall in a particular building. And uh, that is something that is defined in the gazetteer with Pleiades and then reflected into Wikidata. Then we're pointing to uh, that particular, the concept for that particular wall. And that wall has geographic coordinates associated with it. And through the power of the Wikidata query service, then we can ask it to show us uh, the location of discovery or show us any objects that have a location of discovery on that particular wall. We could also um, query such that maybe we want to see all the artifacts that have a, an attested find spot. And uh, you could map them uh, uh, instantaneously using the information that is already existent in uh, Wikidata. Um, I should say that you know the examples that I'm showing you here are kind of our proof of concept. We uh, have not yet finished the work on Dora, um, so it, it will be uh, incrementally improving uh, over the next couple of years. Um, all right, so I anticipate that it. Um, uh, one of the things that that is helpful about this in particular is that it helps us to uh, the the object that I'm showing you is an object that is in a museum collection, and we are using then Wikidata statements to tether this object back to its physical location of discovery, um, and making that information searchable and comprehensible in uh, something like 300 different uh, languages. Um, I do want to walk you through, I guess, a little bit of, of uh, the step-by-step, -step, the play-by-play -play of how you would go about creating a statement like this. Um, so, you know, from soup to nuts, um, we essentially, uh, this particular wall painting we, uh, has a, an item or Q number in Wikidata terms. Uh, and it started out as a single row in a spreadsheet that was extracted from a non-LOD static database. Um, and uh, in this case, it was a CSV uh, from a TMS museum database that we were utilizing. In the CSV, we received uh, from the institutional partner, each row corresponded to a distinct artifact, and each column corresponded to a metadata field, like title, measurements, date, bibliography, etc. cetera. Um, so then we preserved and translated the received information into Wikidata, 
Uh, we used OpenRefine to match each column with the equivalent Wikidata property, then instructed OpenRefine to either create records uh, or create edits to existing Wikidata items based on the data contained within the spreadsheet, or more commonly, we instructed OpenRefine to create new items with each column value corresponding to a statement uh, in the creation of a new item. From there, we could then mine our existing legacy resources um, to contribute supplemental data that specified a find spot more precisely than the institutional database that we worked off of. And um, we made, uh, yeah, and then in this case, we, we modeled this data using the property uh, location of discovery, P189, as I uh, said previously. Um, an important takeaway point is that uh, some of you may be aware of this, but uh, it's just in case you're not, it's uh, important that, you know, authoritative records don't always record a, a fine spot or other essential data point um, by modern archaeological standards. And uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that that data point doesn't exist. Uh, perhaps it does exist, especially considering the archaeological methodological practices, that, or maybe it doesn't exist, uh, especially considering archaeological methodology and how it's evolved over time. But in the case of Dura, at least some of the time, the absence of a specific find spot in the institutional record doesn't always mean that there's no recoverable information about the, the artifact's specific find spot, but only that no one has yet translated the, the relevant data point from analog, usually a textual or narrative format, um, like, uh, into a metadata field that could then be directly mapped using modern methods. In that case, uh, we had to then do the relevant archival research, asserted a supplemental find spot statement using the built-in um, citational structure to point back to whatever primary evidence uh, upon which our claim was dependent. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, then citing that find spot allows us to visualize on a map and uh, citing uh, gazetteer entities as find spots in Wikidata um, for artifacts also allows us to visualize, say, which artifacts were found together in association with a single building uh, or archaeological feature, no matter which collection holds the various objects today. Uh, and we can take this a step further and even assert and clarify when there are uh, relationships between different classes of material. So as, for instance, a, a Depinto or a Graffito located on a particular section of wall painting. Um, so uh, next slide, if you would. Oh, sorry, that, that's the collection of uh, artifacts all found at a same building. Uh, we wrote a query to, to bring that about. Um, next slide. And this is a, a schematic just to walk you through what I mean about relationships between different classes of artifacts. So uh, on the upper left, you see a particular building uh, with a very specific wall at Doria Ropos. Then we have an archival photograph uh, that is actually a photograph of part of that wall. So we can assert the relationship between those two things. Then we have another archival photograph that depicts uh, a foot. And uh, on that foot is an inscription. So we can assert the relationship between the two photographs. Uh, then we can um, uh, transcribe and translate the inscription and point back ultimately to the bibliographic record that um, makes that point. Next slide. Um, one of the last things I'll say is that, you know, this work that we're doing in Wikidata uh, is really just meant to be a, a back end. Um, it's a work in progress, uh, but uh, we are working on building an interface that kind of shields users from having to see all the, the uh, scary Wikidata stuff uh, behind the scenes, but uh, ultimately will allow users to search directly in the interface but uh, their queries will all be calling out to Wikidata. And this is something that, uh, as I said, we're in the process of building. The source code will be available on uh, GitHub eventually. Um, and so others are welcome to uh, build on it. All right, next slide. So just a review of what we see as uh, some of the, the benefits of Wikidata. 
Um, obviously, the multilinguality, the, the ability to search in one's own native language uh, and even contribute in one's own native language is uh, a real boon. There's the built-in tools that allow you to uh, create mapping visualizations essentially on the fly. Um, there's the possibility of collaboratively curating with uh, uh, you know, citizen science projects um, and uh, relationships with local communities, for instance. You have the possibility of having multiple and competing values in order to uh, uh, kind of make transparent to users when there is a scholarly difference in interpretation. Um, it's also sustainable in that uh, since it doesn't require separate hosting or a, a triple store um, and is being contributed to the Wikimedia Foundation that is decentralized, um, it uh, means that your institution doesn't necessarily have to have a long-term uh, plan for um, uh, continued hosting uh, into perpetuity. Um, and that's something that obviously uh, would be a, an issue if you went with a Wikibase instance, as opposed to contributing to the public uh, Wikidata project. Um, as I said, it can be flexible. It can be used to model lots of different kinds of materials. Um, so essentially what we're doing is we're, we're borrowing the, the language or the, the ways of modeling um, different classes of objects from the specialist disciplines, and then we're bringing them all together in the uh, Wikidata environment to allow different classes of objects that, that typically don't speak across those uh, um, silos, um, database silo silos or um, uh, uh, field-specific silos, uh, allow those, those things to speak across uh, those divides. Um, and it's also nice that it is possible to get the benefits of linked open data without uh, having to understand um, how to, to query in, in uh, Sparkle query language. Um, next slide. And this will actually be our last slide. I do want to make sure to um, talk about a few notes of caution, though. Um, First of all, you know, first and foremost, the the ethics uh, with regard to images is something to be thoughtful about as you uh, might uh, take on your own projects that have something to do with archival photographs into the future. Um, in our case, the archival photographs uh, associated with Dura have been online since the uh, early 2000s. And uh, so the cat was kind of out of the bag. You know, nobody had necessarily um, been able to uh, communicate with the local population and see if there were any uh, objections, perhaps, to the, the um, public accessibility, discoverability, reusability of uh, images that may, in fact, depict some of their uh, relatives. Um, you know, uh, Linked open data uh, and sharing of information can be wonderful, but um, it does mean that there aren't necessarily limits to how those images could be reused. So there could be ways in which, say, a, a local uh, person's image uh, might be taken from a, a public, publicly accessible um, uh, repository and utilized in some way that, that maybe the, the relatives of that individual would not be very happy with the way that uh, that image has been reused. Um, and you know, to think about uh, linked open data, if this is all about accessibility and discoverability, uh, you know, in, in terms of the Dura project, one of our concerns is that you know, we are, uh, the, as I said, the, the cat is out of the bag, but in this case, we are potentially drawing more attention to this content that is already available online. And uh, maybe that content hasn't yet been used for purposes that, um, you know, the ancestor of, of someone depicted might uh, take issue with. But as we're uh, making it more accessible and more findable on the web, uh, I guess we're increasing the possibility of that in the future. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're talking about now with uh, our colleagues um, in the UK is uh, a secondary project that uh, actually, you know, brings forth this, this uh, uh, collaborative curation with the local community. And if we discover uh, folks who can identify relatives and whatnot, we'll really have to think through the, the ethics of 
what happens to those images and how we um, proceed in um, either talking with the, the community about the, the availability of these images online and uh, whatnot. Uh, the other thing that I want to uh, draw attention to is, um, you know, of course, in the case of Dura, unfortunately, uh, another cat out of the bag situation, right, where uh, there are, there has already been so much looting at the site that um, making coordinates available and information available about where particular artifacts have come from, especially museum quality artifacts where they have come from, uh, is not necessarily going to endanger the site any more than it already is, because that uh, information uh, was already um, uh, available. But if you are, you know, perhaps working on a site that is um, not as well known, uh, you should be thoughtful about uh, drawing attention to to coordinate information uh, and think about the ways that it might uh, uh, exacerbate um, illegal digging uh, at, at archaeological sites. Then uh, the, the other note of caution is about this open versus closed editorial system. Uh, I know that several people have expressed concern around, you know, the idea that maybe you, you go in and you structure all of your data in a very uh, clean and particular way. And then what if somebody comes in and even, you know, well-intentioned messes it up somehow. Um, I think, you know, there's a couple of mitigating factors here that uh, it's important to know about. So first of all, it's very easy to revert edits in Wikidata. Um, on the uh, history of changes or uh, each, each item has a history page uh, tab that I have illustrated for you and uh, circled in the, the upper right hand corner. Uh, that keeps a record of who has edited an object. Uh, there are also internal chat features so that, you know, often you could just chat with somebody and it was a mistake and you revert the edit and it's no problem. But maybe you also, uh, into the future, we, um, you know, uh, such edits, maybe you do get into an edit war with somebody and both of you think that the representation of the data should be slightly different than the other. Um, again, you know, the multiple values in uh, Wikidata is important. So you could have two statements, two conflicting statements uh, existing at the same time, uh, makes a better illustration of where there might be disagreements within the community. Uh, you know, in the case of an edit war two, there is this ongoing record of uh, the, the changes to each and every object. So in perpetuity, into the future, someone could uh, look at uh, the particular record that I've given you here, maybe myself and somebody else tussle back and forth as to how it should be represented. Uh, maybe we land on a, a compromise that, that we both feel good with. But into the future, somebody could look back and uh, even um, uh, take note of the fact that there had been an, a dispute about uh, how this particular object should be represented. Um, I also want to make you aware of watch lists. It's possible to watch objects in uh, Wikidata so that uh, anytime there is an edit made to something that uh, is of a theme that you are concerned with, uh, you can get a notification. Um, and there are also ways for creating schemas uh, that essentially you set up a way uh, or a, a particular um, model of, of how you want uh, each and every kind of artifact that uh, you're concerned with, uh, how you want it to be modeled, what kinds of properties and uh, statements should be present uh, for each. And um, then using those schemas, it is possible to uh, essentially run your, your data set, uh, the, the particular things on your watch list through a um, uh, an automated process that will uh, tell you um, where there are edits that um, are, are maybe in conflict with the, the schema that you had initially set up um, so that you can target your, your reviews of um, particular um, information, target, target your uh, efforts where they're needed. All right, uh, that's a lot that I have thrown at you, <laughs> but uh, that is what I have for today. Uh, if there are questions in the in the chat, I'm happy to take some. Um, or Monica, if you wanted to um, 
can get any questions and I'm happy to yeah. chat. So, and thank you very much. It was great. Uh, um, a, a lot of things. So unfortunately, we're a bit late, but we can. Um, so our audience definitely is interested. So we can, uh, we still have uh, 10 minutes. Uh, te technically, our time is over, but of course, we had a problem at the beginning, but this happens in Sunoiki, so no problem. <laughs> well, of course, you had many, many things. So I see that uh, we have uh, people in our um, on YouTube, so please, if you have any questions, write your uh, questions. Of course, I imagine there are many, many questions. <laughs> because this project is extremely interesting. And I think we have seen, so um, you mentioned, okay, for example, uh, that you are working on, um, okay, the interface of your website. And so um, to go beyond the scary Wikidata. Well, Wikidata is scary at the beginning, but at the same time, I think this is at least my experience uh, is uh, at least uh, not so difficult to use. The problem is the, is the complexity of that and your project definitely is an example. So working with an archeological site, we have the site, the objects, uh, the work done by archeologists and mm -hmm. scholars on the, on the site and then the language. So, which is a very fascinating component, the language to describe an archeological site. So, which is complex for many reasons for Logical complexity and for, and then for the languages we use uh, today in the past, of course, in the history today, different play, different countries, different scholars, uh, different needs, uh, and definitely place names are an example. We are all struggling with this problem in a digital environment because we have the possibility to add a lot of data, but that's that's a problem. So. Um, and I begin to see, so there is a question in, uh, in our uh, chat, Imran. So thank you for your yeah. question. And um, OK, the first question, how to populate the Wikidata with your data set? Yeah. Okay. So um, there are a number of tutorials online. Uh, and I, I can look to see if I can add some to your resources uh, uh, after, after we're done. Um, that basically teach you how to use a tool called Open Refine. And Open Refine allows you to clean up your spreadsheet and kind of standardize your data as much as you uh, want to. And then you, uh, you essentially kind of parse your, your columns, right? Each column uh, should correspond then to a, a property in Wikidata. And uh, there's a way to tell Open Refine which column uh, needs to be written to which property. Uh, and essentially, like each row of your spreadsheet, then uh, you can put in a bunch of commands that tell it to uh, put the, the contents of each cell uh, as you move down the, the line of your spreadsheet uh, into particular kinds of statements. And um, so that is uh, a, a kind of involved process, and I didn't go through it today. Uh, and especially because there are tutorials that, that are available uh, pre-recorded online. Um, and then from, from there, from once you've cleaned up your spreadsheet and gathered all of your information, whether that's an export from a, uh, an existing database or it's hand uh, collected uh, archival information that you have essentially uh, parsed from a textual narrative into um, individual cells in a spreadsheet, then you can batch upload uh, all of your uh, content all at one time using this tool uh, called OpenRefine. Yes, definitely. I know that this is one of the possibilities, of course. Uh, well, there is a lot of manual work that has to be done. Uh, and uh, this is uh, inevitable, I think. And, and I think there is also a lot of, so you, you, you showed uh, um, very interesting examples and Wikidata is very rich. So because there are so many statements, properties and values, this is the difficult part of it. So right. use uh, also a generic language in some way, which is fundamental because we have specific needs, especially for an archeological site. But right. our um, effort is to try to, um, well, not adapt, but to use a generic language and uh, to express or so our specific needs. Even if uh, uh, this is at least my experience uh, uh, in Wikidata, the language is very, very rich. And uh, 
So I think, and you, you showed examples. Yes, please. Yeah, I didn't want to get too far into the weeds, but I do want to uh, make it clear that, you know, this is a community project. And so when there are properties that are not existent, uh, that need to be uh, in there for a particular niche kind of um, description or area. So our project, for instance, uh, has has made petitions to the community to create properties associated specifically with uh, inscriptional indexes. Um, it is possible to, um, and very easy actually, to uh, propose a new property to the Wikidata community uh, so that it, it can serve both those niche needs and the, uh, the more generic language uh, um, uh, that, that you were referring to as well, Monica. Exactly. Um, and yeah. with the multiple values, I mean, this is another uh, thing that, that I think is a real boon with the, the work that we're doing because you know, for instance, something like uh, a house at Dora, right? We could call it a house or we could call it a domus, <laughs> but the domus is maybe the more, you know, field specific term, but maybe somebody who is coming is not an archeologist or is not, you know, an ancient world person is coming to this data set looking for something, you know, domestic, wouldn't necessarily know to use the term domus. And since both of those things exist in Wikidata, we can create more pathways into the object, more ways of searching it, more, um, uh, accessibility in in this way yes. and um i did want to say you you talked about uh the um one of the intimidating things about wikidata i think is the the volume of vocabulary and uh properties and all of that and so one of the things that our project is doing is we are documenting and uh, making a list essentially of all of the properties that we're using for representation of particular kinds of uh, classes of data. So for instance, we have one scheme for, you know, what do you do with a, a, an inscription? How do you express the, the kinds of things that uh, epigraphers tend to be looking for uh, with this data set? And how do you, um, what properties do you use to kind of parse that? And we're making that all public. Uh, and this too is a is a work in progress. We'll do this with buildings, with archival photographs, archival drawings, um, inscriptions, and uh, some other classes of of specific artifacts, so that other projects can look at what we've done. Maybe they will make different decisions. And uh, you know, we are happy and uh, eager for feedback and uh, additional interlocutors. But uh, one of the things that we we hope with our project is that it gives other people a, a leg up, a place to start um, with the kinds of properties that one might uh, use to express particular kinds of data sets. And uh, those who are interested in getting involved in Wikidata and might be a little intimidated, one of the things that, that you can do to get started uh, that is really impactful for the community but is uh, not so intimidating is to just take a topic that you know something about and know the bibliography on and just add resources, just add source yeah. statements, bibliographic statements to support existing uh, Wikidata statements. And what that is doing is you are essentially using your power as a, a scholar who can read a particular language and you are unlocking that information from a single piece of scholarship in a single language and you're making that accessible to, uh, to, yeah. to folks multilinguistically. Exactly. This is very, very important. I totally agree. And this is important also for our students <clears throat> when they start to use uh, something like Wikidata. So exactly. Choose a topic you know, or at least uh, you're interested in. You, uh, you use a bibliography and then you try to translate this into a Wikidata item. And then you will discover the language of Wikidata. <clears throat> and step by step, you will learn how to add this uh, uh, information in Wikidata. So I, I, I totally agree. This is valid for a research project. And your project is an example, of course. You are uh, expert of this specific uh, um, field and you are giving this contribution because we need to begin to build languages for philology, archaeology, the humanities, using the potentials of Wikidata but also for students or other people interested in, in, in such a resource, this is the way to, to start. And you can start with a simple topic. And remember that Wikidata, of course, ingest data from Wikipedia and other Wikimedia resources, but is independent. You can uh, create a new Wikidata item even 
if uh, um, there are no extant Wikipedia pages. So these are two different things. Of course, we can also have Wikipedia pages correspond with Wikidata items. So is in this in this case more flexible because, of course, starting a new Wikipedia page requires. Uh, um, so it's different, I mean, it's possible, but of course, uh, uh, it's different, I mean. We can create Wikidata items for also for small concepts. Small. Right, yeah, that's what I was going to say. The notability uh, yeah. threshold is different between yeah. uh, Wikipedia and, and Wikidata. So, you know, mm. really anything that, that exists in a collection uh, is entirely fair game for Wikidata. Whereas in Wikipedia, you wouldn't create a, a Wikipedia article on a particular loom weight, you know, from one corner of the site, but you could have a Wikidata item for that loom weight. So and this is important because we can't have Wikipedia pages for everything. This is another important thing that have been learning while using Wikipedia, which is valid for many other encyclopedias and resources. The problem is that in a digital environment, the temptation is to add items for everything. Wikidata is different, so we have this granularity where we can add specific uh, uh, items. Okay, unfortunately, now our time is over. I would like to go on <laughs> for... <clears throat> well, there's so much that one could say, and I do want to make myself available as a resource uh, for anybody that's getting started with, with Wikidata and thinking about uh, its uses for the classical world. Uh, you can look me up. I'm at Bard College, and uh, you can reach me at my email there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anne, for your availability. So this is very important. So your slides, so uh, you have shown many examples of the kind of work you are doing. There are many links, so really we can follow your work. And so, exactly, so Anne is available. They are doing <coughs> a great job. And, sorry, <coughs> my voice. And of course, Wikidata is open, I mean, because technically other people can contribute to it. But uh, so please uh, get in touch with Anne and her team for this fantastic project and also for, for um, learning, learning more and you learn by doing. And we can see, so going to the beginning of your presentation, link it open that the power of these triples, subject, project, object, is a simple, but you can represent really many, many things. And uh, the language of an archaeological site like Dura is uh, really uh, an example, an extraordinary <clears throat> example, where we have so many layers on right. top of the archaeological site, but we can represent them. So now, unfortunately, we have to <laughs> end our session. Thank you for this great session. Again, uh, the outline is in GitHub. You have a list of uh, these uh, topics, links. We are going to add the slides. Of course, there are many other interesting uh, discussions like uh, colonialism and then the possibility to annotate human beings. But Unfortunately, um, we can't discuss them now, but I'm sure, given that you said that you're available, we will invite you another time to discuss these uh, very, very important issues and the possibilities we have today to add data uh, related to an archaeological site, like human beings in an archaeological site. And then, of course, uh, the possibility to go beyond our uh, West institutions. We are lucky. We know this is important for our students also. We are lucky. We have so many resources. We are representing these data with our language, but we have to think uh, of accessibility in terms of other countries where we don't, where these possibilities are not extant. And then, of course, we have to represent the contribution of other countries, for example, to an archaeological site. Uh, this is a, an, important, uh, an important topic, and your project is very, very important also in this, uh, in this sense. But I'm sure we will organize another session when you have time next year about these uh, important issues. So, Anne, thank you again for your time, for joining us today, and for our audience. Thank you, 
I know that today we we use the more time, but this was important. So uh, for our program, we will um, meet again for our last session of this summer term on uh, July 6. Uh, we will have a final session about um, different Wikimedia resources. We will explore a bit Wikisource and Wik Wikiquote. And this will be the last session of this summer semester 2023. Okay, so thank you again. Thank and you. Thank you, Anne, and see you in a few weeks for our next session. Bye, 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 bye. Bye.